All right, welcome everybody to the API design and architecture <clears throat> track here at API Days. For all of you coming on in, there's plenty of seats up front, so don't be shy. And, you know, we're, we're in this post-lunch section of talks, right? And so I think I need y'all to look to your neighbor and give them a high five, right? Come on, do that right now. It'll wake up a little bit. You'll make some new friends. I see a couple of you doing it. Oh, there we go. All right. That's, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. Well, up next, we've got Rod, who's going to talk about multi-grain services for the next couple minutes. Take it away. All right. Thanks. Okay, you can see the slides. Perfect. And I can advance. All right, great. So we're going to talk about multi-grain services, everything from micro to mini to macro to monoliths, and what's good and bad about each of them, why you might want to use one versus the other. Quick question, who's got microservices already in production today? Decent number, okay, keep your hands up. Uh, lower your hands if you wish you didn't have microservices in production. A uh, decent number, okay, yeah. They're not as easy as they look on paper, are they? All right, so we're going to talk about why that might be and, and some thoughts about how to get to microservices or how not to get to microservices. So I'm Rod Cope, CTO of Perforce Software uh, in the development application platform API management space. I was CTO of RogueWave, CTO and founder of OpenLogic in the open source space, and I worked at some big companies and small ones and some things in between speak around the world in lots of different conferences, but you don't want to talk more about that. You want to take a test. So we'll start out with the pop quiz. All right, which one is better? You're going to get three choices. Option A, it's big, it's bulky, it's hard to change and update, but it does only one thing, and you can kind of figure out what it is. It's the monolith. Option two, they're tiny. They're easy to update and change. They're made of all different kinds of technologies. Good luck trying to see the big picture. They're the microservices. Option C. They range in size from big to huge. They mix legacy and modern all together. It's kind of hard to figure out what's going on sometimes, but they're pretty practical. They are the mini services. So which one's best? Depends what you're trying to do. Blowing up a planet is very different from other jobs. All right. If you look at these things on a spectrum, on one side you have microservices. They're all about encapsulating little bits of business functionality together independently, independent data stores. They don't share. That's really important. You can deploy them any way you want. Use lots of different languages, platforms, components. Many services, similar, but you can relax the constraints a little bit. Sometimes you can deploy them together. You can share data stores. There are pros and cons. We'll talk about what they are. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, macroservices or monoliths, one data store, all shared, all the functionality of your, your application together, deployed together, typically one set of technologies. On the right, better agility, looser coupling, but on the left, you get lower complexity, easier to run. It's a trade-off you make. So think multi-grain and not just micro. We'll talk about best fits for each of these. So start with the monolith. It's got a bad reputation over the last few years. People think of monoliths like this, horrible spaghetti code, nobody can understand, there's no tests, you're afraid to change it because it'll break, right? It's just, it's messy, it's ugly, nobody likes it. But a monolith can also be a well-architected piece of software with layers, different components, separation of concerns. Today, we tend to think of a monolith as, or the modern monolith as a three-tier web application, web server, application server, database, right, those kind of things. Not one code base, but it's one application, typically all deployed together. That's what we're going to talk about as a monolith today. And you get that architecture thanks to Conway's law because your teams are structured that way, at least historically. You've got UI people, business logic developers, and database people. Sometimes they don't see eye to eye, they fight a little bit. You get three different tiers in the application. You get a reflection of the organization. How the people are organized is what your architecture looks like. So that can be, in the bad sense of monolith, traditional top-down command and control. You do this, you do that, very slow and heavy. One big team, sometimes developers versus DBAs. 
lots of finger pointing, lots of friction. It's not good. It can be waterfall, lots of upfront design, slow testing, slow deployment. Nobody likes it. And vertical scalability. If you want to serve more users, you buy bigger hardware. But a monolith, again, doesn't have to be like that. It can be agile, can be scaled agile with feature teams, with CI and CD and DevOps and automation, with horizontal scalability. So there are different ways to do monolith deployment as well. Some advantages of monoliths are that you can have fewer versioning issues in some cases. For example, you might only have one SQL database, one version, one language. Right? It may be hard to decide to upgrade, but you typically only have one when you're deploying. You typically have less latency to deal with. Right? One bit of your code is calling another bit of your code all in memory. It's in one program at the same time. You're not calling across a distributed network where calls are hopping across multiple VMs, multiple Docker containers, et cetera. You might not have to deal with XA transactions if it's all in the same database. It's kind of easy to handle transactions. You don't have to worry about saga patterns and eventual consistency and compensating operations and all that really complex stuff in a monolith. It's straightforward. You also typically only have one of everything, one code base, one set of deployment artifacts, one build process, one language, one platform, one tool chain. You can have developers and testers move around on the app because they're all doing basically the same thing. You're using the same components. This is very different when we talk about microservices. Some challenges, here's why a lot of people are moving away. No small changes. It can be really tough to make a change, especially if, if you have to redeploy everything or get a bunch of people to agree and have lots of different tests and certification steps. It can be slow and heavy. You can get locked into technology. We picked Java 9, let's say, or Java 6 for our standard, and we're stuck with that for 10 years plus because it's just so hard to change. Typically, it's scale all or nothing. If you want to handle more load, you've got to replicate all the code. It can be heavyweight. It can be hard to agree on versions. Right? Do we upgrade the database? Do we upgrade the application server in which versions? And one bug could, could affect the entire app, and it can be hard to move to Docker containers. If you've got monoliths that expect to have full access to physical hardware or their own dedicated virtual machines can be hard to distribute that in something like Kubernetes. So there's a lot of challenges. So best practices, if you do go forward with monoliths, at least do it the right way. Be agile. Use CI, CD, DevOps. Layers and modules. Separation of concerns. Horizontal scaling. Use development accelerators, especially in a Java space. Right? You can use things like JRebel, so you can go right from changing code to it's live and you can just test it. You don't have to stop and build and redeploy and restart servers. So you can feel like you're getting the benefits of a Node.js or Python, other kind of environments that you might be locked into, but still keep using Java. So there's a right way to do it. Okay, before we look at microservices and mini services, let's just talk about services in general. Where do we come from? Well, SOA, about 10 years ago, service-oriented architecture, really focused on business activities, self-contained black boxes, a service. You, you call it, you get a response. You don't really know about the details. Should be distributed, should be separately maintained and deployed, should have a lot of the benefits of modern microservices. It wasn't originally about SOAP and ESBs and WSR and heavy process and central control and vendor lock-in. Has anybody gone through all that with ESBs and SOA kind of stuff, yeah, kind of horrible. It didn't have to be that way, that's what it turned into. But it started out as a, kind of a clean separation. And that's what I think microservices are trying to be, kind of SOA done right. So microservices in a nutshell, it's the Unix philosophy. Do one small thing, do it well, and then you combine a bunch of those small things to build a bigger solution. This is a very buzzword compliant definition I came up with, but I think of it as SOA for distributed teams in the world of DevOps, or again, SOA done right. And you have to follow bound and context domain-driven design to get the benefits of microservices. Everyone has to be developed independently in its own little separate world, and then you translate to and from all the other users and microservices. That way you can move fast. 
not be coupled to another service. So unlike a monolith, where all the functionality is in one application, and if you have to handle more load, you have to scale up the entire app, with microservices, each little piece could run, let's say, in a Docker container. So you can scale up just the microservices to meet the need as required. So you get much more efficient use of your resources with microservices. So some characteristics. Usually processes talking over the network. It doesn't have to be. It could be IPC. It could be OSGI container like Akana uses. But usually it's over the network. Independently deployable, easy to replace, focused around small, specific business requirements. Developed independently. You can use different languages, different platforms, different data stores. Small, typically async message bounded. We'll talk about that in a minute. Fully automated, elastic, resilient, composable, minimal, complete. All these good things. This is all the, the great stuff people like about microservices, but it's not all perfect. There are some downsides to being loosely coupled. For example, you can't share, share data storage. Right? Each independent microservice has to have its own dedicated data store. If you don't, and you start sharing, then what happens if one service wants to change the schema and the other doesn't? One wants to change the data store entirely and the other doesn't. Now you get coupled, you slow down, and you lose the benefits of microservices. It starts to be more like a monolith. Ideally, you can't even use REST or HTTP across microservices because you don't want synchronous communication. You want cascading timeouts where one service fails and it takes down dozens of other services. It needs to be all asynchronous messaging. You have to deal with eventual consistency. You have to handle compensating operations. This is hard. There's no free lunch here. A lot of benefits, but you have to pay for it. So SOA, it's more about business value. I think microservices is more about technical strategy. Strategic goals versus project-specific benefits. Interoperability versus custom sort of one-off integration. Full reuse versus purpose-built implementations. They both favor flexibility and evolutionary refinement. So it's kind of business, top-down strategy versus technical, tactical implementation. So advantages of microservices, I think this is what people really like about it. Small problems solved by small teams with small solutions using the best tools for the job. So with every microservice, you can try the new language, try the new framework, try the new paradigm for deploying a REST service or GraphQL or whatever it is. Right? You're not locked in for a long period of time. You can rewrite that one little microservice because it's small. You can change your mind over time. But there are a lot of decisions that you have to make about microservices. Decisions that are best made up front before you start, that can be hard. Things like, do we use a service mesh or a proxy? Do we use Istio or Linkerd or Envoy? We'll talk more about that in a minute. How do you communicate? HTTP, HTTPS, HTTP2, gRPC, asynchronous. What are we going to do? What about state management? Where do we store the data? Kubernetes stateful sets? NoSQL, SQL, flat files, cloud services, where are you going to put your stuff? How do you coordinate teams of microservices when one team says we're deprecating this API, or we're adding a new feature, or we're removing a feature? How do we notify the other teams? How long do they have to respond? So how, how do you do the people side of communication? Right, how do we deploy? Again, in the cloud, on-premise, Docker, Kubernetes, VMs, physical hardware, we have lots of choices. Operations, monitoring, metrics, tracing, logging, where do we put all that data? And do we make all these decisions independently for every microservice? If you only have one, that's fine. If you have 500, that's not good. You don't want to have 500 different monitoring solutions, 500 different places to put your data, et cetera. So it's good to figure this stuff out up front. Some challenges. The biggest one is distributed computing. That's hard. It's one of the two hard things in computer science, right? Naming things is the second one sometimes. But distributed computing is always a tough one. There's a huge cognitive load going from just, OK, I have another function that the developer down the hall wrote in the same language, I just call it. There's no latency to now I'm looking up and discovering this other microservice written by a team I don't know, using different protocols, 
different back ends. Um, what does it do when it times out? Fail over? What, what's the SLA I get from that team? There's a lot of latency, load balancing, all these extra things now you have to think about as a developer. It's a huge burden up front. Service explosion. If I have hundreds of services, where do I go to find out about them? How are they secured? Are they all implemented the same way? What about documentation? What about testing? And then things like team dynamics. With microservices, you can have one team focused on their microservice, and like, this is great. It's a great S API. It's well documented. It's fast. It's reliable. It's up 100%. Oh, but the whole project failed, and we're out of business because we were only looking at our one microservice. We forgot to think of the whole project and the company. Right? So there's some, some challenges there. One of the big challenges I met, mentioned before, it's distributed computing latency. Don't forget, it's not zero. If you have a whole tree of services calling each other, latency just goes up and up and up. And what do you do about timeouts? So I think done right, microservices, you have a culture of automation. If you only have three or four microservices, you can get away doing some, some things by hand. If you have hundreds of them, it has to be fully automated. CI, CD, testing, maybe use something like Perfecto for testing, DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes, cloud, whatever it is, you've got to automate all the way. You can't deal with all that by hand. True DevOps, including monitoring, failover, self-healing. And that's really important, again, when you look at hundreds of microservices deployed in the environments I'm talking about, you're always in a state of partial failure. You have to embrace failure. You have to implement circuit breaker patterns and bulkhead patterns and other things to make sure that when one service goes down, it doesn't ripple and take down the whole system. You, you have to always understand you're in a state of partial recovery, partial failure all the time. Zombie processes, VMs fail, hard disk crash, networks drop out. Plan for that up front. Be resilient in an automated fashion, not responding by hand. So some best practices, extreme automation. Everything I said, make it automated. No humans in the loop on any of this stuff. Use service mesh like an Istio. Use API management. We'll get into that like Kana. Monolith first. It's a little bit controversial, but I'll talk about this in a few minutes again. But it's a lot safer choice to start with a monolith to understand your business problem if you're doing something new, get it working, show value, then convert to microservices instead of starting with microservices paying this huge price up front to figure it all out and then running out of time. So quick recap, A API management, that's all about consistent security across all of your APIs. If you have hundreds of microservices developed by dozens of teams all around the world using all different languages and technologies and platforms, you don't want every one of them reinventing the wheel on security. You want to have a consistent, I think of it as an API firewall, your front door to all hackers in the world, go through that first, get secure, and then your microservices are behind where they're safer. So consistent security, transforming protocols, transforming data, doing orchestration, things like that, so that then you only focus on writing your APIs. Service Mesh, like an Istio, lets you get a lot of the benefits behind a firewall. It's consistent security and traffic management and deployments and tracing and metrics for the microservices deals with all the networks and all the moving parts for you so you don't have to deal with that. You can just focus on writing your microservice. So API management, external focus, it's the firewall. Typically there's one, it's enterprise grade. Security focused, stability focused, it's the front door. Service mesh, internal, you've got lots of them, lots of different languages, lots of different teams. It's all about flexibility and availability. Being able to try out new things and going fast. And then the APIs, that are exposed to the public, call into the microservices to do the work, maybe with some orchestration. So analysts, uh, the Gartners, for example, kind of showing future architectures moving towards what they call this MASA, microservices and uh, service architecture, uh, mesh architecture. Applications turning into small apps, lots of different apps using services, some of which using microservices, all independently developed. Uh, Martin Fowler, I think, does a great kind of chart, shows the difference between starting with a monolith and microservices. The green kind of bar there is productivity of monolith. It starts higher because you have less overhead. You're not thinking about distributed computing and installing all the SDO and Kubernetes on it. You're just doing the th what you know how to do. You show value. But then over time, the monolith gets big and slow and heavy, and you lose productivity. 
Microservices, you pay up front, kind of a tax, and then you get better results in the long term. But Martin even says at the bottom here, the skill of the team far outweighs the architecture choice. So if you're thinking about from scratch, starting with microservices, and you can't even spell Kubernetes, it's going to take you a lot longer than it, than it looks like on the, the cool slides. So summary of API service mesh. They address different needs, but they're both critical, especially in microservices architecture. There's no one size fits all solution. Um, just the way it's shaken out for whatever reason, the commercial vendors focus on API management, open source focuses on the service mesh. Uh, things like Akana, um, enterprise grade API management with that focus on security policies, integrated development portal, discovery, things like that. Mission critical security. And then Istio on the service mesh side. Kubernetes support, all about rapid deployment, metrics, telemetry, policies on the implementation side. So we talked about monolith, we talked about microservices, and in between is mini services. I think this is important uh, if you, you look at what some of the analysts like Gardner are saying. Uh, about 90% of the companies that try to deploy with microservices will find it's too disruptive and they'll go back to mini services instead. It's just too much change to bite off. So what are many services? This is simplified definition, but I think of it like one business function. It's kind of like a bundle of microservices that are, that are tightly related. Like, for example, you have an e-commerce site, and you might have a shipping service that handles um, DHL and FedEx and, and other shipping uh, providers under one service, as opposed to having separate microservices, each for a different shipping provider. Right, so that's one way to think about it. So it's a little bit fatter container. It's a little bit heavier, a little bit slower, but it does relax some constraints. You can share data store, which is the big one. Maybe same schema, same database, because they're so tightly related. You can use synchronous and HTTP communication, because again, you understand deeply how these are related, and you can deal with timeout issues and other things on a custom basis. Now, the danger here is it's a slippery slope. As soon as you say, well, let's just add one more service to the mini service, now suddenly it gets huge and slow and heavy and it's a monolith. So you have to be very disciplined, I think, to use mini services to keep it very clean. Some of the big advantages are less cultural shock. You don't have to maybe change your teams quite as much as you'd have to do with microservices where they're really independent and they're small little teams. It favors business value over architectural purity. Right, it's, it's a little more practical, but there are some downsides from a technology point of view. And you can use more traditional web communication, so again, it's easier to get started. But overall, I'd say use the best tool for the job. Monoliths are still good, still great for some things. Microservices are great for some things, but don't just do microservices because it's cool, it sounds good, it looks great on your resume, your CV. Right. So think multigrained. Microservices, yes, looser coupling, greater agility. But macro-services, monoliths, lower complexity, it's easier to run and understand. In fact, from an understanding point of view, that's why I kind of say grok in the top left corner, for just understanding, with everybody on the team involved, monoliths can be easier to understand the architecture. I got a green checkbox there. Because almost anybody on the team can go up to a whiteboard and draw five boxes with some arrows, web server, app server, database, some HTTP goes here. Nobody can draw 500 boxes and 1,000 arrows on a big microservices architecture where every single protocol, language, async, communication mechanism, et cetera, is different. It's just way harder to understand what the big picture. The reason people moving away are the red Xs under mon monoliths. Reuse and change is much harder, very slow. Microservices is much faster, much easier on that side, and that's the trade-off people make. So conclusion? I think one size fits all is wrong. They do different things. They have different pros and cons and trade-offs. Consider your problem, your team, and your time frame. If you have six weeks to go from today to a working prototype to prove some business value in the market, and, you, and again, you can't spell Kubernetes and you never installed Istio, don't even try it. You're going to fail. Do what you know how to do quickly, show value, convert to microservices architecture when it starts to show promise. So if you want to talk more about Microservices, mini services, monoliths, macro services, API management, service mesh, come see me at the, AP, the uh, Econa booth.
And I think we have a break now, but maybe you can uh, get some questions during the break if I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that is correct. We, uh, we are out of time, but we are on a break. So if you want to catch Rod, now's a good time. But also there is the continuous API management book signing happening over the break. So if you want to catch an autograph, now's the time to do that. We'll be picking things up here again in just a couple of minutes. So cool. Have a great day. All right, thank you.